Good evening. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, joint event of the Suterbeek Programme and the Centre for Contemporary European Philosophy, uh, both of the Radboud University. Uh, my name is Lisa Duland. Uh, I work at the Suterbeek Programme and I will be the moderator this evening. And uh, we are very glad to welcome uh, Peter Trauni, uh, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the prestigious uh, Martin Heidegger Institute at the University of Wuppertal. Um, he is uh, the publisher of what has become known as Heidegger's uh, Schwarze Hefte, Black Notebooks, uh, and also author of Heidegger und der Mythos der jüdischen Weltverschwörung, um, that I have roughly translated as Heidegger and the Myth of Jewish World Dominance, um, that was published around that time. And we are honored that he is here tonight uh, and will give a lecture on anti-Semitism uh, in Heidegger's thought and in general. Um, for some, his character, the character of Heidegger, had already been tainted by his Nazi sympathies, but maybe now with the publication of the Schwarze Hefte, the question has arisen if these have also contaminated his philosophy. Have his political views affected, affected his philosophical thought? or the other way around. Um, Peter Trauni will give a lecture of about uh, 45 minutes, and afterwards there will be plenty of time for questions, about half an hour. Um, but first, uh, a short introduction by Jean-Pierre Wils, Professor of Political Philosophy uh, and Philosophy uh, of Culture at the Radboud University. And um, have I forgotten to say anything? Yes, I want to especially welcome the guests uh, of, this, uh, of this day's conference, uh, Politics and Philosophy, um, uh, the Heidegger case, uh, in which Trani also uh, participated. So, Jean-Pierre. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, I welcome you in behalf of the Center of Contemporary European Philosophy. And I welcome my colleague from Wuppertal University, Peter Traun. Uh, so once again, uh, Peter Trauni was the editor of uh, the, uh, let's say, famous black notebooks, the Schwarzen Hefte, uh, Martin Heidegger's, and he uh, published a very interesting and um, famous book on the discussion uh, about a year ago. This is uh, just show you the book, but this is the case. This. Uh, <laughs> and they are not complete, so there are other volumes uh, uh, coming. So, um, uh, Martin Heidecker is um, still a very, probably the most controversial philosopher of the 20th century, and uh, I think he is still considered as being the most influential and our important philosopher of uh, the last century. That's not the same being the most influential and being the most important philosopher, but um, through all kinds of political sympathies, uh, uh, a lot of people admire his uh, philosophical thought. There are quite controversial interpretations of his uh, philosophy. But I think the uh, publication of the Black Books has added a kind of... Uh, new phase of this uh, uh, controversy about his political views and the relationship between his philosophy and his political thought. So the, the, the question in the center of the whole affair is, uh, could it be that the uh, obvious anti-Semitism in Heidegger's writings infected his whole philosophy? Um, or even worse, uh, did his philosophy from the very beginning on contribute to his anti-Semitism? Uh, I, I think these questions are difficult to solve. And uh, I think all of us who know Heidegger's writings have a kind of ambivalent feelings about the philosophy. There is a fascinating aspect in, in Heidegger. It's, it's difficult to escape from the fascination of its language and its way of... Um, questioning the whole tradition of philosophy. On the other side, there is a kind of problem in this philosophy. How could this famous, prominent, excellent thinker came so close to the Nazi ideology and to anti-Semitism? So our guest this evening, 
uh, where is he? Oh, he is sitting over there. He's uh, Peter Charney. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so he is, uh, I, I, I think, so the most uh, prominent interpret of this uh, discussion. And um, I open the floor now to my Wuppertal colleague. Dear Peter Trauny, it's, it's up to you now. <laughs> you cannot escape anymore. <laughs> At first, of course, I have to thank for this nice introduction and um, yeah, for the for all what you what you said about 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 my work. I have to thank for the invitation by Antonio Simino and um, well, I'm. Lucky to be here and to probably <clears throat> discuss with you a little bit this um, problematic, I think, problematic topic. And um, yeah, we will see what what uh, what I will uh, have to say. So I I was asked um, to give um, another Heidegger expert paper. And I was I was uh, very happy about this that I just uh, can can uh, be a little bit more uh, free in my in, in in what I want to say and I really therefore want to well say at the beginning something about the um, the problem I I have or we have with uh, the general problem we will have with Heidegger and we how we can deal with it how we can respond to this uh, this problem then i will say something more general about the the the, pro the relation between philosophy and anti-semitism as such and at the end <clears throat> i will come back to to heidegger um, and i will say something about my my interpretation um, um, of this um, of this um, so-called anti-Semitism. So we should see right up from the beginning the problem which still concerns us. And around, I begin with the quotation, around 1940, during World War II, that's the context of every anti-Semitic uttering by Heidegger, the World War, World War II. Uh, Heidegger writes in a so-called black notebook, I, I, will, I will read, Therefore, all imperialism altogether, and i.e. in a mutual increase and exhaustion, is driven toward the highest consummation of technology, whose last act will be that Earth itself blows up and the contemporary humanity disappears. What is no misfortune, but rather the first purification of being from its deepest disfigurement as brought about by the precedence of beings, uh, so maybe just once again. The, therefore, all imperialism altogether, and uh, i.e. in a mutual increase and exhaustion, is driven toward the highest consummation of technology. So that's, that's his concept of a self-destruction of technology. Whose last act of this self-destruction will be that Earth itself blows up and the contemporary humanity, humanity disappears, so that mankind disappears. What is no misfortune, uh, but rather the first purification of being from its deepest disfigurement as brought about by the precedence of beings. So this is a key passage for the understanding of what happened with Heidegger at the end of the 30s, what happened with Heidegger when he opened his text for I would say, anti-Semitic ideas. The key word, the key word in this key passage is without a doubt, uh, purification of being. Uh, a rarely used expression by the philosopher, for it actually does not fit in his thinking. I do not want to explain in detail what purification of being can mean, but what I want to emphasize is the threat and the danger of such a thought. Purification 
is the liberation from dirt in a metaphoric form. What is pure seems to be totally by itself. Nothing disturbs its self-relation. Therefore, purification was always a moral and a political idea. To be a pure democrat sounds as if one has arrived in the best moral and political condition. But Maximilien de Robespierre was a famous pure democrat who only demanded what the people wanted to be done. Until at the end, he was a too pure democrat, and the most purest democrat, Joseph Ignace Guillotin, defeated him. Purification, <clears throat> which seems to be the liberation from all danger and threat, is itself the greatest danger and threat. Morals and politics must be very careful not to get lost in ideals of purification. Where a light is, there must be a shadow. Every human being has its weaknesses, its stains. The dif uh, this differentiates us from moral machines. And still the purification from purification is dangerous. Purification from purification is not a double negation, but a hyper-purification, which as purification reverts to a specific form of contamination. Contaminated by purification. Is this possible? And I would say, yeah, this is possible. Purification of purification is the most dangerous poison. Just let being be, we could say, and indeed the later Heidegger did say this. The later Heidegger did say this, just let being be. So purification from purification is another way of contamination. And this also counts for the interpretation of Heidegger's anti-Semitism. We should not demand for a moral and political pure philosophy. A theory of morals and politics, which would try to represent purity, would be most dangerous. And was purity not one of the ideals of every totalitarian system? Purity of justice, purity of the will of the people, purity of race. To be clear, Heidegger underlines purity of being, not of beings i.e. that Heidegger was not an agent of the purity of the blood, because blood belongs to beings. But nevertheless, there is no being without beings, and this must be accepted, must be even acclaimed, because we are beings. Anyway, if we agree that we should not demand for a purified philosophy, we should not condemn Heidegger's thinking for its anti-Semitic errancy. We should criticize it in the strongest ways, but we should not try to purify, to clean the history of philosophy. Every philosophy has its darkness. Darkness is an element of thinking and living. Total enlightenment would not only be the end of philosophy, but the end of morals and politics, the end of a human stained life. So that that is my statement at the beginning, uh, how we, in general, should deal with these problems in, in, in Heidegger. Uh, the condemnation of Heidegger would be the purification of purification, and this is not what I would try to, to do, or what I would propose that we should do. Okay, so now I come to the next point. Um, um, the the more uh, general um, access to the problem of uh, philosophy and anti-Semitism. The relation between philosophy and Judaism is since the modern times difficult and often hostile. But to understand this relation correct correctly, it is uh, at first necessary to consider a historical difference between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. There is anti-Judaism since the ancient time. Anti-Semitism exists since the last centuries. 
Today, anti-Semitism, of course, implies anti-Judaism. Anti-Judaism is a certain type of anti-Semitism. Indeed, the concept of anti-Semitism is and has to be extremely general. We actually cannot give an exact definition. That's one of the problems in discussions about uh, anti-Semitism, that we don't have a definition of anti-Semitism. Therefore, uh, in most of the cases, there are discussions whether a statement is anti-Semitic or not. Very often, an anti-Semite does not think he is one. This is, of course, not unproblematic for a reasonable discussion. Uh, <laughs> um, it's actually very painful in these kind of discussions that you always have to argue that somebody is an anti-Semite who thinks he's not an anti-Semite and so on. That's uh, very, very boring in a certain way, but it's a problem of the... Of, of, the, of, of this concept, of con the concept of anti-Semitism. Anti-Judaism is a historical phenomenon of Christianity. The Christian, Christian church, well, there's probably no other, the, the church ostracized Jews in, resol in resolutions on synods and councils. Thus, Jews and Christians were separated in their life worlds. These resolutions were justified, justified by the well-known accusation that Jews did not only ignore Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, but also participated in his killing. Thus, narratives emerged and became a tradition. In their tenacious, tenacious defamation, they even are alive today. One of these narratives is the ritual murder of Christian children in the sense of the symbolic repetition of the killing of Jesus. Still, the propaganda of the Third Reich used this narrative. More effective as this narrative until now is the image of the Jewish profiteer or usurer, der Wucherer, or the Chefra, Schacherer. There was on the one side the prohibition to become a member of the guilds of the merchants or of the crafts of the craftsmen, and on the other side the prohibition valid for Christians to deal with money and to take interests, zinsen, so that the Jews were compelled to adopt this task, produced the still actual legend of the special relation between Judaism and money. Thus, a Christian anti-Judaism was mixed up with life-worldly differences which were disadvantageous or even dangerous for the Jews. On the <coughs> threshold uh, to, to modern times, it then was Luther in his writing on the Jews and their lies in 1543, who not only condemned Judaism theologically, but appealed for expropriation of Jews and for burning Jewish houses and synagogues. At the same time, they are accused, or were, were accused, because of their denomination to be the chosen people and because of their assumed greed for money. Luther's text is a collection of anti judaistic affects. Perhaps, therefore, by the way, Raoul Hilberg begins his famous work about the destruction of the European Jews, with a longer reference to this Lutheran, Lutheran text. Where Luther was uh, an anti-Judaistic Tartar, other philosophers or theologians of the later ancient times and the Middle Ages controlled their anti-Judaism. Furthermore, Jewish philosophers were well respected. Philo of Alexandria, around the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, or Moses Maimonides in the 12th century, unfolded their thinking without any defamation or restriction. Philo, who possibly was a participant in the transformation of the Greek understanding of Logos to the Christian understanding, was read and interpreted by the Church Fathers. Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed was translated into the Latin language only 50 years after its appearance in times where anti-Judaism was a constant part of the Christian everyday life. <clears throat> a professor for the Hebrew language, <laughs> all the time the professors, at the University of Heidelberg, Johann Andreas Eisenmenger, 
at the transition to the uh, 18th century, wrote a text which after his death in the later course of the century became a great success. The book Discovered Judaism stands at the beginning of an anti-Semitism which now starts to reign more and more also over intellectuals. Although it repeats once again anti-Judaistic stereotypes, in my opinion, it emphasizes an aspect which should become more and more important for modern anti-Semitism. Already the title suggests that uh, Judaism disposes of intentionally concealed threaten and threatening secrets. If anti-Judaism knows the legend of hidden crimes, like killing Christian children, anti-Semitism knows the narrative of a Jewish hidden doctrine, a hidden conspiracy. In the 18th century, the century of the Enlightenment, something happened in philosophy, what perhaps not immediately, but in the 19th and 20th century had a significant impact in its relation with Judaism. I would say that enlightenment is actually the beginning of anti-Semitism. <laughs> Let us be clear about what happened in the centuries before. The anti-Judaism of the church causes persecution, persecutions and pogroms, example given the displacement of the Spanish Jews, the, Def the Zephadim, at the end of the 15th century, among them a family from which Baruch de Spinoza, born in the ghetto of Amsterdam in 1632, will appear. But the anti-Judaistic agitation takes place in a certain distance to the great philosophers. Of course, their Christianity is not free from anti-Judaistic ideas, like we can see, for example, in the sermons of St. Augustine. Or Saint Augustine yeah. But because they are Christian thinkers, they had to hold on to the biblical and historical significance of, of Judaism. St. Augustine has harsh words for the Jews, but he does not think of appealing her persecution. One could summarize, indeed, Christian philosophy shares a more or less anti-Judaistic effect, but exactly because it is a Christian philosophy, Judaism theoretically and practically cannot be segregated because it belongs to Christianity. Christianity, with all its anti-Judaism, needs Judaism. Christianity can neither forget nor assimilate Judaism. Maybe this is a, the, the pro problematic character of this relation, that it, cannot, neither, it can neither forget nor assimilate Judaism, but nevertheless it cannot uh, appeal for persecution and, and annihilation. But in the modern times, and modernity with enlightenment begins a differentiation between Christianity and philosophy with which Judaism gets into a new, a different and dangerous situation. We have to consider this differentiation of philosophy and Christianity more carefully, for it belongs to an event, to a discovery, which sh sheds light also on the so-called being historical anti-Semitism of Martin Heidegger. That's my concept. Not very clever, but <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a concept. Uh, being historical anti-Semitism of Martin Heidegger. So it's really not, not, yeah, not, uh, not, not very clever. Not, not really the histo his history of philosophy is characterized as the history of ontotheology. 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 So I will explain what this means and why I want to speak about this, um, this um, concept of ontotheology. To'on. To'on is the being, das Seinde, the surrounding objective, be it the natural or the technical. For Aristotle. He asks Aristotle, Tito on. What is the being? How is that what is constituted? What are its categories? At the same time, Aristotle, like Plato, contemplates the divine. The divine, too, is a being. But, as the twelfth book of metaphysics shows, a very special and unique being. The Christian thinker, could refer to this differentiation of beings very well. 
Roughly speaking, it returns in the signification of the being as the ens creatum and the divine as the ens in creatum. This difference of beings separates the finite, created being from the eternal, creating, not created being. All experts of this matter may excuse this simplicity, but, well, it will work here. In such an ontotheological structure of philosophy, Christianity or theology, with all its anti-Judaism, can find and take its place. <clears throat> but there, where just this structure is criticized and caused to totter, Christianity and Judaism appear in a new light. Where is this structure criticized and caused to totter? At first, in the time of enlightenment, i.e. by Kant. Kant's critical project of the three critiques differentiates God, the divine, and the empirical being insofar as he maintains the impossibility to recognize God and therefore excludes the divine from theoretical philosophy. Of course, for practical philosophy, the existence of God, albeit as a postulate, as demand, still remains necessary. Not all readers of Kant had the patience for this difference. For example, Heinrich Heine thought that in Kant's philosophy, uh, I quote, the highest lord of the world swims undemonstrated in his blood. Only because of compassion with the average human being, he, he says, actually, for his, you know that, for his servant Lampe, who needs something to believe in, Kant has reanimated the corpse of Deism. But if Kant integrates the existence of God <clears throat> into the difference between theoretical and practical reason, left Hegelians like Feuerbach and Marx are coming to different results. Now God becomes a mere anthropological, functional proje projection or an institution of the dominating classes to make and keep the poor stupid. I remind the famous words of Marx, you all know that, that religion is opium for the people. Then it is Nietzsche who, as you know, appeals the death of God and nihilism as its presupposition and consequence. For Heidegger, this Nietzschean thought of the death of the Christian God is obligatory. But it was the Christian God who kept philosophy in its structure as ontotheology. The disintegration of the unity of philosophy and Christianity is a disintegration of ontotheology from which now the theos, the theos retires, so to say, what is left is a thinking as ontology, a philosophy who is solely related to its Greek origin, to the question for the on, for being, or in the words of Heidegger, the sense or the meaning of being. Um, where Christian thinkers, like Thomas of Aquinas, for instance, without a problem, could tie in with Plato, Aristotle, and Neoplatonism by integrating these positions into Christianity. Greek philosophy now was to be liberated from its Christian alienation. Medieval philosophy as a whole was understood as an alienation of philosophy. Moreover, Christian culture was now represented as a colonization and therefore corruption of the bright culture of the Greeks in poetry, philo philosophy, art, and architecture. Especially Greek polytheism now appears in a new light when Christianity considered the Greek gods as paganism. German poets and thinkers since Winckelmann were enthusiastic. Under these German poets and thinkers, the gods poetizing thinking Hölderlin Nietzsche, who spoke of Dionysus, and Heidegger, of course, who also spoke of gods, um, and not anymore of, of God, um, but at least of a God, what is not actually a Christian, 
Christian, um, Christian um, expression. Only a God can save us. It's not only God can save us. It's only a God can save us. That's absolutely blasphem blasphemic for a Christian. Where Christianity was denied, the Greeks were celebrated. This event of a differentiation between Christianity and philosophy had consequences for Judaism. At first, they were political. The history of enlightenment and, of course, of the French Revolution is connected with the history of the emancipation of the Jews, so-called emancipation of the Jews. This emancipation belongs to that de-Christianizing of the political sphere. But not everybody interpret, interpreted this emancipation as an improvement of the Jewish situation. The famous rabbi and Zionist Joachim Prinz, for instance, writes in his very interesting book, We Jews, from 1934, I quote, the way of the Jew out of the ghetto into the European society was not very salubrious for him. It was too fast, and many of them lost their breath. In German, der Gang der Juden aus dem Ghetto in die europäische Gesellschaft ist ihm nicht sonderlich bekommen. Es war ein zu rascher Weg, und vielen ist dabei der Atem ausgegangen. The loss of the ghetto was a loss of religious and spiritual security. For the emancipation of the Jews was in itself an emancipation from religion. The loss of religious security belongs to the decline of ontotheology, to the differentiation of philosophy and Christianity. As in the 19th century, new forms of racism and anti-Semitism are entering the stage of history, there is no necessity anymore to understand Judaism as an element of the own Christian culture. On the contrary, Judaism, belonging to Christianity, is interpreted as an alienation of the Greek beginning of philosophy. What Judaism and Christianity are separating from uh, a Greek culture, the gospel, the oiangelion, a new and different understanding of the human being in his guilt, in God's grace, in his responsibility and love for the other, are denied. This is the case, for example, in Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, where the Jews are the inventors of the spirit of vengeance or revenge, and therefore the origin of a morals of slaves. Heidegger often speaks about the spirit of vengeance, especially when he speaks about morals. Actually, all the time when he speaks about morals. For him, morals or morality in the sense of a normative, i.e. categorical imperative, is mere revenge. <clears throat> Two incidental remarks, one concerning the differentiation between philosophy and Christianity, the other concerning a moral implication of Christianity. First, philosophy in its, in its uh, reduction on a liberation to its origin in Greek culture, of course, does not necessarily have to be anti-Semitic. Uh, Leo Strauss, a Jewish student of Heidegger from the beginning of the 20s, considers, perhaps under the influence of his early teacher, Jerusalem and Athens as a hard alternative. Either the faith in a, revel a revelation is true or a rational argument. The logos of Christianity and the logos of philosophy are a contradiction, and in this contradiction mutually connected. This is not difficult to explain. If Jesus Christ is characterizing himself as the way, the truth, and the life, as the only access to the Father, then there exists no argument for it. You cannot say because. <laughs> would be funny. Uh, because I'm the Son. So that <laughs> uh, therefore, faith is not only necessary, but primarily possible for Christianity. So that's, that's the point. In this sense, St. Paul called the philosophers fools because the philosophers did not understand that a human being was considered as truth. They thought and think that truth needs reasons or arguments. Thus, revelation and rationality really are an alternative 
And nothing here is necessarily anti-Semitic, of course. Secondly, Hannah Arendt once had said, maybe apropos, but she said, she did say that, that the Holocaust, uh, well, she did, didn't call it, she said, I guess, admi administrative massacre or something, that the Holocaust would not have happened if the people still would have believed in hell i.e. in the necessity of a last and eternal punishment for their crimes, their evil. National socialism was not only a milieu for strange uh, sectarians, who for example wanted to reactivate the cult of the Germanic tribes, but also an absolutely secularistic, decidic, and in this sense rational ideology. One thought in, uh, one thought in categories of a totalization of technology, on the basis of, a, of an utilitaristic, nay, nihilistic perspective. Therefore, they didn't have a taste for hell. Of course, Heidegger denied this perspective, but his anti-Christian motivation, and there is an anti-Christian, very strong anti-Christian motivation in the Black Notebooks, but his anti-Christian motivation was very probably one of the reasons for his early sympathy with the National Re Revolution. Actually, for him, um, the, the, the Christians are in, in more, more passages a target of his, of his rage, uh, more than actually the, the Jews. Now, the drama of the problematic relation between philosophy and Judaism is not told to its end if we would not mention an aspect more or less unknown to medieval anti-Judaism. The aspect of biologistic racism. But it's not wrong to think that this kind of racism is a phenomenon beyond the boundaries of philosophy. Therefore, I at first have to come back to what I call the disintegration of ontotheology. The slow disintegration of ontotheology in the two centuries between 1600 and 1800 is in itself the disintegration of the unity of philosophy and natural science. Since the Greek beginning of philosophy, nature was a systematic part of philosophical thinking. Also in medieval philosophy, for Thomas, for instance, nature, as in creatum, as creation, was a moment of ontotheology. But with the development of certain technologies in the 16th and the 17th century, began an emancipation of natural science. And I emphasize this with the development of certain technologies, not of actually theories of technologies. That's a difference. If, if Galileo wouldn't, 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 wouldn't have proved his hypothesis, the church was not very, would have been not very interested in, in Galilee. But because he had the possibilities of an empiri em empirical research, this was, this was the problem. He had the technologies. Hegel was the last philosopher who successfully integrated nature and natural research in his philosophical system. After his death in 1831, we have to admit a deep cleavage between philosophy and natural science. Where natural science became the paradigm of, the use of useful science, philosophy fell into a crisis, nay, philosophy itself became a permanent crisis for itself. Where scientific or pseudo-scientific results were and perhaps are accepted as last truths, philosophical ideas were and perhaps are considered as useless statements of queer fellows. This was an atmosphere where pseudo-scientific narratives about a hierarchy of races could find its profit. The biologistic racism which wants to exclude the Jews by the blood as foreign to the species from the pure blood of the body of the people emerges in the second half of the 19th century. Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favorite Races in the Struggle for Life is published in 1859, a few, near, a few years ago, Arthur de Gobineau wrote his essay sur l'inégalité des races humaines. Darwin, of course, was not a racist. 
but he you more or less of course <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, actually? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he was a racist. Uh, Darwin, of course, somebody has to check. Darwin, of course, uh, was, uh, Darwin maybe or not was a racist, uh, but he used the term of race in the context of natural selection. So that's the problem. In the idea that there is a biological evolution of species and races was centered the idea that there are scientifically detectable natural inequalities between human races. Racism seemed to have a scientific objective fu fundament. And are we really far away from this position if the color of the skin is still considered as an indication of a different cultural character? In the context of this new racism, now appears the concept of anti-Semitism. Wilhelm Marr, a left anarchist, very, very left anarchist, published, publishes in 1879 an essay with the title The Triumph of the Germanic, Germanic Kind, Germanentum, about Judaism, considered from the non-confessional standpoint. All hints emphasizing that the concept, because it, yeah, all hints emphasizing that the concept of anti-Semitism anti is not exact, uh, exact, uh, exact for the Arabs are Semites too are dispens dispensable. The concept of anti-Semitism was coined right up from the beginning to argue against Judaism uh, beyond the other concept of anti-Judaism. So it's just a polemic remark that people only say, well, this con concept of anti-Semitism is wrong because it includes all the Arabs. So that's. That's, that's crap. The biologistic anti-Semitism, in difference to anti-Judaism, attempts to demonstrate empirically that the Jews are representing a minor race. When in anti-Judaism, Christianity was motivating the polemic uh, in anti-Semitism, science should deliver the objective results of a hierarchy of the races. Such a position led, for example, to elaborates of a Hans F. K. Günther, who made his career in the Third Reich as an ordinary professor for Rassenkunde in Berlin. Between 1940 and 1945, Günther is professor, for, uh, is a professor and director of the Institute for Rassenkunde und Bauerntumsforschung at the Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg, where Heidegger also was teaching. But, by the way, very probably there was no contact for Heidegger's thinking was not prone to this kind of anti-Semitism. On the contrary, he um, criticizes the attempt to deliver a scientific fundament for racism. What does not mean that he rejected the topic of, of race uh, at all, but he, wasn't, he, was, he was critical with this, with this scientific attempt to, to give an empirical uh, concept of race. He himself spoke about race in a, in a quite positive sense. So in this, in this sense, it's, 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 it's true to say that Heidegger criticized a certain kind of racism, but it's not true that he criticized racism at all. That's, that's, that's not true. Now we have the horizon of a general depiction of the relation between philosophy and anti-Semitism. The question now is uh, how Heidegger's philosophy can be located in this topography. How belongs Heidegger to this history of the relation between philosophy and anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism, presupposed that Heidegger's thinking belongs to it indeed? Let's let us here take a look uh, on the historic figure. Um, Heidegger grew up in a Catholic mil milieu where he very probably came into contact with anti-Judaistic stereotypes like the Jewish inability for labor and the Jewish preference for money dealing, money dealing or trade. By the way, his brother worked for decades in a bank in Meskirch, but it's different. Different. Furthermore, Jews are considered also in a religious perspective as foreign. They do not belong to the home, to Heimat. 
But in a long and difficult, um, but by the way, just, just a remark on this, in Heidegger's text, the foreigners and the Jews are often ident ident identified. So if he speaks from uh, foreigners, uh, you have to be very aware that in many, in many cases he, 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 he meant the, the Jews. But in a long and difficult liberation from Catholicism or in general from Christianity, he leaves the atmosphere of anti judaistic resentments. Nevertheless, Heidegger manifests an animosity against Jews at the university. The national revolution also seems to allow the revolution of this university. Heidegger becomes rector of the university in Freiburg. The national socialists claim a dominant role of the Germans in Europe. No, with the racial laws of Nuremberg, the coexistence between Germans and, by the way, German Jews stops. A separation and persecution begins. The Second World War starts. Now for Heidegger, everything is at stake. The decision must come. Is the war a self-destruction of technology and universal capitalism a purification of being? Or will it end in a final stability of the technical capitalistic world? This is his question. The anti-Semitic passengers, in my view, the anti-Semitic passengers from the Black Notebooks, which since its publication in March of this year, so it's not far away actually, it's recently, which since its publication in March of this, one thing that we the last years always talked about this, but it was in March. Of this year caused vehement discussions in the public sphere and in Heidegger research are all coming from this time from the context of World War II. We can, at first, exclude two sources of his anti-Semitism. Anti-Judaism and a biologistic racism anti-Semitism. We cannot find this in Heidegger. Heidegger criticizes, like I said, the biologism of the, biologism of the National Socialists. The question then is, how enters anti-Semitism the thinking of Heidegger? What is the source of this anti-Semitism? What is Heidegger's anti-Semitism? <clears throat> At first, I myself have to advise caution with these questions, by the way. Jean-Paul Sartre, after World War II in 1954, uh, wrote his famous Réflexion sur la question juive. In this text, and this is an interesting text, actually, it's really, really interesting. In this text, he explains that every anti-Semitism, also the biological one, is a metaphysical anti-Semitism. This is the case because the interpretation of Judaism as such is only possible on the basis of metaphysical judgments. If Judaism is, in what way ever, evil, then this judgment is a metaphysical presupposition. The difference between metaphysical and biological concepts of anti-Semitism is problematic. I just want to uh, criticize here in a certain way by myself uh, if I say that Heidegger's anti-Semitism is, in his own interpretation, a metaphysical. So what is, uh, what is Heidegger's anti-Semitism? To respond to this question, I have to refer briefly to Heidegger's narrative of his history, to the history of being. Football? Soccer? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, uh, to the history of being. Of course, here too, I say sorry to the experts of this matter because of my simplification, but I have to say something about it. It's, it's, uh, it's an idea of, of, of the thinking of the 30s, of his thinking of the 30s, and it's, it's actually the central, I guess the central idea of this, of this time. Heidegger presupposes a first beginning, he calls it first beginning of philosophy, with the Greeks. <coughs> Philosophy is here, of course, not a science of certain scientists, by the way, but the first form of our relation to the world as a whole. That's his concept of philosophy, it's not science. The first beginning becomes the history of metaphysics, of ontotheology, uh, theology, like I said before. This history gets a kind of a break with the beginning of modern times. Now, with Descartes, philosophy constitutes modern science, natural science. The human being begins by force of his and her will to dominate nature and to organize the world in a technical manner. You know the 
definition of the human being by um, Descartes as maître et possesseur de la, de la nature. Um, this tendency becomes a universal behavior. In the will to power, everything gets under the power of machination, his concept for technology, Machenschaft in German, machination. Uh, the power of modern technology. This character of history can only be interrupted. This techno technological character of history can only be interrupted or ruptured by an other beginning who is in a mutual relation to the first beginning, when the first beginning belongs to the Greeks. The other beginning is a task of the Germans. The decision I mentioned before, the decision of World War II is the question whether such an other beginning is still possible, i.e. whether technology can destroy itself or whether machination becomes a total domination. By the way, this idea, uh, we had it, we had it in, the, in the afternoon, this idea that Heidegger thought that the, that the Germans and the Greeks have this special relation is uh, by no means a very original idea by Heidegger. It's, so, it's, it's, it's in, the, in, the, in the history of, of, of German spirit, if you can say so. Uh, uh, already there in Winkelmann, and it comes to Goethe, it comes to Schiller, it comes to Hölderlin, of course, it comes to, to, to Nietzsche, it comes to Wagner, every, every intellectual thought that the Germans and the Greeks have this special relation. Well, of course, the concept of the Greeks is, 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 uh, is, uh, is modifying in the way, but it's, this is not a, a very original idea by Heidegger that the Germans and the Greeks are linked together in this way. Beneath these two protagonists of Greeks and Germans, in this narrative, there are still other actors. The Americans, uh, respectively Americanism, the British, the Bolshevists, respectively Bolshevism in contrast to the Russians, the National Socialists in contrast to the Germans, and this is, by the way, a parallel, a parallel between Germany and Russia, and the Jews. In Heidegger's narrative, it's a Hegelian style of narrative, I would say. In, in Heidegger's narrative of this time, every actor has to realize a certain task. Generally spoken, Americans, Bolshevists, the British, National Socialists and Jews are representing machination. Only the Germans, and in a certain manner the Russians, are knowing it's overcoming. The being historical task of the Jews or of Judaism is then to represent what he calls the principle of destruction. Now we have to understand how this principle of destruction could become the power of machination of technology and capitalism. Uh, capitalism is obviously not, not a ter term used by Heidegger, but it's in the background of his, what he thinks, actually. What predestines Judaism to be the medium of the principle of destruction? What is the question? That is the question. What predestines Judaism to be the medium of the principle of, of destruction? To interpret the role of Judaism in the history of being, Heidegger refers to two narratives, which beyond anti-Judaism and biologism belong to the usual stock of anti-Semitic determinations. Uh, firstly, Jews have a special talent for a calculating thinking. They know how to calculate. Th secondly, Jews are worldless, i.e. homeless. In my view, it's actually Heimatlos. Weltlosigkeit, worldlessness is homelessness. These two anti-Semitic clichés, maybe secular forms of anti-Judaism, appear in a further narrative of world Judaism, Weltjudentum, a fiction which transcends the other stereotypes of a talent for calculation and homelessness. The narrative of a Jewish extra talent for calculation is, of course, connected with the medieval image of the money-lending, interest-taking Jew. We find it, for instance, in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice in persona of the Jew Shylock. Uh, just one comment. Because of this persona, Shakespeare here and there is accused of anti-Semitism. I think this is finally wrong. Although Shylock appears as a calculating Jew, he is sadly defeated. In the end, he is a broken man. He is compelled to convert to Christianity. If we would think that this is Shakespeare's own wish, his own solution concerning Judaism, 
Well, he certainly would not be the poet he is. The image of the Jews as a homeless people ranging the world, so to say, goes back to the historical fact of the diaspora. The diaspora, or in Hebrew, Galut, of the Jews begins in the year 586 before Christ in a military conflict with the Babylonians, which finds its end in the destruction of the first temple and the exile in Babylon and Egypt. A Christian popular legend from the 13th century reacts to, this di to the diaspora in, on its own way. A man, a Jew, mocked Jesus on his way to his crucifixion. A punishment uh, of this figure called Ahasver should be eternally homeless. So that's the punishment, that he should be eternally homeless. Thus the image of the eternal Jew and compare, for instance, the movie by Fritz Hippler from 1940 with the title The, 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 the Eternal Jew, belongs to the standard of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Modern anti-Semitism does not need these anti-Judaistic background, calculating as the first talent of capitalism and global cosmopolitan mobility are the two sides of the same coin. The two stereotypes of Jewish capitalism and mobility can be assembled to an image which found a very effective narrative in the protocols of the elders of Zion. The historian researcher in questions of anti-Semitism Wolfgang Benz in German, Germany calls the protocols a text incunable, uh, text incunable of modern, modern anti-Semitism. Still today, this fiction it's an absolute reference, so to say. Still today, this fiction of a Jewish world conspiracy is alive in the internet, of course. It emerged in the Dreyfus affair at the end of the 19th century. The origin of the protocols is more or less unknown. The author, anyway, profits by already existing texts, which he combines to a dangerous construction. Its career begins after the Great War. Hitler, already in the 30s, in a monograph, was called a disciple of the elders of Zion. Indeed, the text can be read, can be read as a guide or manual for, the, for a ruthless realization of the power of an invisible political association. Thus, this evil fiction creates an immediate threat of an enemy who virtuously uses his power to make the states into a war by taking benefits of it, to move the states into a war by taking benefits of this war. And this is a stereotype you can find in Hitler's uh, speeches all the time, that the Jews actually de delivered the reason for the world war and therefore they have to be punished. There are two indications leading to the assumption that Heidegger's anti-Semitism belongs to the semantic field of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The first one is a historic note coming from Karl Jaspers in his philosophical autobiography. He reports about Heidegger. I spoke about the Jewish question, Judenfrage, about the maleficent nonsense of the Elders of Zion. He responded, but there is a dangerous international connection of the Jews. The second indication is more important, not only that Heidegger uses the term world Judaism, which necessarily belongs to the semantic space of the protocols. It does not, it does not, it does not matter whether he did read them or not. If you, if you say the word world Judaism, you say protocols of the elders of Zion. But it is important that Heidegger found to anti-Semitic statements during years of war where the destiny of the world was at stake and where he thought to see an invisible Jewish world power working for the victory of a technical capitalistic future. But to understand this anti-Semitic fiction of a conspiracy of the world Judaism, against the rest of the world. We have to notice a certain moment of this fiction I think, I think is very important, which seemingly not only belongs to Heidegger. Already Richard Wagner, whose cultural and political importance even in the 20th century cannot be overrated, was convinced 
that the fictional Jewish threat of the German culture will result in a total decline of the Germans. Therefore, Arnold Zweig once called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion the central piece of a popular folkish paranoia. And it is Heidegger too who, after the war, thinks that a Jewish world conspiracy will exterminate the Germans, at least in their spiritual and cultural existence. Be times we will have to reconsider, although I guess the psychological dimension of Heidegger's statements about Judaism. Finally, it seems, finally it seems to be a hy hypertrophic care for a loss, which is driving Heidegger to the idea that Judaism is the principle of destruction in the history of being. In this sense, he thought that a totalized technical capitalistic access to the world would destroy everything what he was saving in his thinking. Home in the sense of Heimat, poetry, thinking, a human being who lives in his mortality. World Judaism appeared as a representative of a technical, capitalistic, medialistic world where all this did not count anymore. Here, in this being historical signification, I think we find the core of Heidegger's antisemitism. In this context, I want to remind us a passage in a text from around 944 where Heidegger comes to a strange but interesting anal analogy. So one other quotation in a certain way. The subordination of truth, aletheia, that's the Greek term for it. The subordination of truth under the Platonic idea is, and now, the first step i.e. authentic and furthest reaching step to a serial production of long distance bombers and to the invention of the radio based communication system. This expression can be connected with the other attribution of Judaism as principle of destruction. It is the universal idea who produces long distance bombers, i.e. mere destruction. In this sense, the Platonic idea has the same signification as Judaism. Indeed, at the end of Heidegger's anti-Semitic thoughts, the Jew appears as the Platonic idea. Therefore, one could speak of an anti-Semitic anti-Platonism. By the way, that's interesting that St. Augustine reflects the possibility in De Civitate Dei whether Plato could have been influenced by Jewish prophets, most of all from the book of Jeremiah. That's interesting that the church fathers had an interest to link uh, Jewish, uh, the Jewish origin of their own religion with Plato, and that, of course, Plato was very important for, the, for, the, um, for, for Christ Christian theology. So in this sense, I guess everything comes together for, for this kind of, of, of thinking of Heidegger. And now, and now, after the Shoah, the actual event was very probably unknown to Heidegger, the Shoah. His statements carry weight, more weight indeed, as he could guess. He kept silent about what happened in the extermination camps. Statements referring to the techno-genocide can be counted on one hand. They cannot be taken as a relevant contribution to the thinking of the Shoah. Heidegger's Heidegger silence has its own tone. It is, uh, it's very hard um, to, to interpret. Uh, I, for my, I, I but myself, think that actually there is no place in Heidegger's philosophy where he could have said sorry or something. That's, so in this, in this respect, actually, it's a philosophical decision. There's a philosophical decision to this science. Heidegger's, Heidegger's thinking, one could say, probably is damaged, but it will endure the discussions, the leg legitimate and illegitimate attacks. It inscribed itself, itself too deep into the philosophy of the 20th and the 20, uh, 21st century. And after all, it is not only Heidegger's thinking, or it's not only Heidegger's thinking, or it's not only Heidegger's thinking which is at stake here. It is anti-Semitism itself, leaving a trace in one of the most important philosophical works of the 20th century, an anti-Semitism 
expressing it itself as a fear of or for a technical, capitalistic, medialistic world, even if we emphasize that this fear does not necessarily has to be an expression of anti-Semitism. We have not overcome anti-Semitism. And by all means, it makes no sense to think that always and only the others are anti-Semites. Thank you for your kind patience. so much for your lecture. It was um, enriching really and I, uh, I want to read it again later on um, because I don't think I've taken it all in but a lot of the things, yeah. So I'll pick out a few things um, and then I'll go to you, of course. Um, Why do you think that people are reacting so strongly now to this case of anti-Semitism in Heidegger? Might it be that we, we philosophers, do not like the idea of a philosophy that is not pure or neutral or... Well, um... Actually, I'm, I was astonished of this reaction. So I cannot really understand the reason. Well, on, on the first end, of course, I think it's, it's, not, it's not very comfortable to see <coughs> that a philosopher in times of shore, in the time of persecution, has these has this ideas, these uh, strange ideas. It's not very comfortable, it's not very, it's not, it's, it's not very fine, but but on the other side, I thought that uh, even even after a first shock, I had I had myself. I thought that okay, so what shocked in, in you? The what most? what shocked you the most? Uh, that that somebody who is actually maybe who who, who saw what happened to to the Jews. Uh, of course, he saw what happened to the Jews. He saw he knew that they were persecuted, even if he didn't didn't know something about the. The Shoah, probably or whatever, uh, he knew that they were persecuted, and then he found the 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 attitude of such a theory that was in my that was in my eyes a little bit shocking, or pretty shocking at the beginning. But after this, I thought that well, in times where nearly everybody was an anti-Semite, uh, from a historical standpoint, it's it was it was actually it would have been more. So, uh, so, surprising if, if we wouldn't have these passages, that if it would be it would be a big surprise. It would have been a big surprise if Heidegger, who in a certain way in private in private was was a, an anti-Semite, yeah. if we if we if we wouldn't have found anti-Semitic passages in his thinking, that would have been I guess it would have been a bigger surprise than than what. So that that's my ambivalence in the question: why actually people are so so shocked or so excited or whatever by, by this by But this you problem. did mention Wagner and of course it's been a problem but it seems to me that that uh, Wagner being an anti-Semite hasn't been as problematic as Heidegger being one. Yeah, uh, probably because Wagner wrote so such a fantastic music. Yeah, but what's the difference? <laughs> you writing fantastic music, Heidegger writing fantastic philosophy or what 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 would the difference be yeah. between the music and anti-Semitism and philosophy and anti-Semitism? <coughs> yeah, well, at, at, at first, of course, we think that well, we, we, we probably think that the philosopher should be more aware of um, strange ideas. Um, uh, we think this way. We think yeah. that a composer can be crazy or something, a poet, it's, 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 it's an honor of a poet to be crazy. There's no poet who is not crazy. So that the philosopher has to be reasonable in a certain way. That's what we presuppose, that he has to be reasonable. And then he has some uh, such, such, then he creates this strange narrative where, where we have this protagonist. We think that this is, this is, this is not really 
something of a, for a reasonable man, I guess. So that's the, the point. Uh, if somebody, whatever, uh, composed, who, somebody who composed Tristan and Isolde, so that he, he can be a little bit crazy. But yeah. uh, somebody who writes Being in Time, that's, that's different. Yeah. Tristan is not Being in Time, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to think of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions? <coughs> I have many questions, but thank you for this great lecture. Oh, that's, uh, sorry, there's a microphone coming. Yeah. Thank you for this great lecture. I have many questions, but maybe one that um, uh, intrigues me. You said that Heidegger, the core of Heidegger's anti-Semitism can be traced back to his, and I cite you now, his hypertrophic care for a loss, the loss of being, of everything that he cared for, everything that he valued. So um, that's the core of his anti-Semitism. So is not anti-Semitism in Heidegger than a kind of scapegoat mechanism for not thinking, not being able or not wanting to think capitalism? Because you said capitalism is always in the background. And when I read Heidegger on the Gestell, you know, with a Marxian perspective, I always, well, this is about, this is all about capitalism. This is not just about technology, it's about capitalist technology. Machenschaft is capitalism. So is it is this Jewish conspiracy for Heidegger a kind of scapegoat, scapegoating mechanism? And maybe even his thinking of technology, the way he thinks technology, like Jacques Ellul does, is always is also a kind of technology being a scapegoat for that, which is actually uh, done, caused by capitalism. Um. I would say so that that there is there is something like uh, yeah well this 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 loss is 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 is, is very is very I guess it's a, it's it's a, it's it's a strong there is a strong atmosphere of this loss in the in the forties at the beginning of the forties of Heidegger and especially for in forty five he nearly gets crazy yeah? he had a nervous breakdown uh, as we know uh, um, and and it's interesting your thought that you think that probably he is not. You said something like this that he is not able to think really to think really capitalism universalism the universalistic uh, dimension of, of money and, and technology and therefore he needs something like like the Jews to be to to uh, as a representative he can deal with in a certain <coughs> way because he was maybe not aware of the fact that that yeah that money is. <clears throat> is a universal uh, that that even the Dutch people has to use money and not only the not not only the the Jews. Uh, so that in, in this in this sense, maybe maybe that's that's a good, that's a good 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 um, um, good, good point. Um, he 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 is not he. By the way, he he's not dealing with uh, uh, Judenfrage from Marx. It would be would it would it, would have been interesting what he actually said to this. He he is criticizing Marx, of course, as Jew. But he is not referring to to this to this text. But if he, when he says that there is, I didn't, I didn't quote it, but the, where he speaks about the Jews as a principle of destruction, he 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 is naming Marx as a representative of this destruction, and maybe it has something to do with this with this uh, inability to think uh, capitalism in a in a more sophisticated way. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? Uh, I just, just have to say that there's an anecdote of this, I am calling this in my book, about money. When he, was, when he wanted to, to sell his the manuscript of, of, of being in time to the Marvel archive, uh, because they, they, needed the, they needed the money, uh, he, <laughs> he called Anna Arendt to sell it. Uh, he said, "Well, we we don't have a clue of money." <laughs> well, actually, that's Elfriede Heidegger said that we don't have a clue of money. So you could do it. So that's, that's strange, uh, but but she did she did it without without saying something. So it's just she maybe she thought whatever, but uh, but that's uh, that's an anecdote. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, now that that uh, Hannah Arendt is mentioned again. How did that work? How can you have Jew friends, a Jew lover, and be an anti-Semite? Anti-Semite, sorry. 
how, how, how do you deal with that? Especially at this point, I don't know actually what it what it does to somebody. But but it's but it's of course in 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 the re, in anti-Semitism research, it is um, it is it's well known. It belongs nearly to an anti-Semite to have a Jewish lover. It's 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 one of the presuppositions to be an anti-Semite. <laughs> uh, uh, but no, it's it's right. It's 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 not an argument to say he but had why? he had. Why I laugh? But why? I don't know why. It's, 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 it's a not, fact. Maybe it's, it's it's a certain thrill, it, it, you know. It works. Okay. You know, I don't know why, but it's uh, but it's uh, it's it is it's a fact of 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 of, of uh, anti-Semitic research that that you can see that 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 Heidegger, Hannah Arendt says that even 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 Hitler had. She said, "50 or whatever, prima Juden." So uh, that he that that the exception belongs always to anti-Semitism. That you that you that you can say, well, in general, the Jew is is whatever uh, a threat of of of, of civilization <coughs> or. Maybe the threat of civilization in the in the name in the same meaning, but uh, but then you have of course the exception of that. And this is something what belongs together. It's not it's not it's not a it's, it's not it's not a it's not a contradiction actually. Mm. Um, is that something we should keep in mind <coughs> today? Is that a lesson maybe from Heidegger to us now? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. <clears throat> well, one of the one of the problems in in, in Germany, uh, I was told, is I gave, I gave, for instance, I gave a, a seminar about uh, anti-Semitism, and what is what is in <coughs> Germany is at stake is actually that nearly nobody knows the Jews uh, that there is no contact anymore and maybe even if there is a Jew he does not say that he is a Jew so so there is there are no Jews anymore and so so everybody who speaks about Jews is like that you should speak about spectres about ghosts that's actually I guess in, in Germany this is this is uh, I guess uh, more or less uh, 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 the, the, the thing it's not it's not that 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 Somebody could say, "Here, I have a Jewish friend." There are nearly, but, but I was told that the student said that, and I discussed it with the student. There were whatever, 120 students, so not only 10. So that they said to me that this is actually the point. They, we don't know, and we don't know any anymore uh, Jewish culture, Jews or something. We don't know what it is actually. Mm. So, um, so the exception, the Jew as exception, I um, don't think that this is. This is a point today. What is a point in a certain way? I try to say that at the end, that that when we speak about capitalism and technology and, and this and, and the problems of this, we we should maybe we should think about uh, the um, inheritance about the history of this of the the genesis of of this of these topics and the genesis the genesis of these topics is. Is, is, is of course linked and connected with anti-Semitism. So that's not, that's not a question. <coughs> that doesn't mean that that everybody, everybody who says capitalism is, is an anti-Semite. But we have to be aware of that there are that there are images in the background who who have to do with who have something to do with this with this with this history. Um, the manager or whatever the banquier. Uh, the greedy banquier or something mm -hmm. that's probably probably not very far away from certain uh, anti-Semitic uh, um, images. Yeah, and in a way, dehumanizing or depersonalizing it's the greedy banker over there. It's yeah. Not a man. Yeah. Yeah. And if like me. Or... Yeah. If it, 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 the, we know that New York, Wall Street, all Jews. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, this question about capitalism. Um, you see the oh, there's a microphone coming again. Okay. Uh, you seem to suggest that, uh, or that was the suggestion perhaps made, that Heidegger lacked the 
the capability to think capitalism or something like that. But could you also have argued, along with uh, yeah, uh, common uh, Nazi ideology, that indeed his, his whole idea of Jews at the bottom of both capitalism and Marxism and the technological form of national socialism was a kind of deeper analysis, in his view, of all these phenomena that have to do with materialism, um, calculating uh, perspective on reality, etc. So that he would have, perhaps, I, I don't know, but, but that he would perhaps thought that this is even a deeper understanding of capitalism, as well as Marxism, as well as certain forms of national uh, socialism, than, uh, than just lacking the technical ability to think capitalism as something I'm, I'm pretty sure that he thought this way. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but I think <clears throat> what is not very interesting in a philosophical way to to think about the, about the capitalism in an ideological way, so in a, let's say, uh, Marxist, communist topology. I guess that is maybe not the point, but what I think is, is more interesting in, in a philosophical way, and he didn't do that, is to understand the phenomenon of capital as such. I guess that's, for instance, that's what, what Derrida did in, in a later, later text in Le, Le Cap or something. So what is actually capital What, in an economic sense? I guess you can have you can have an interest in this, especially if you are speaking about technology, because uh, if, if you if you're looking on the on the on the side that technology is always linked to production, it's not there's no technology without production. It's in a certain way uh, as a, as a phenomenon always linked to, to what we call capital, capital, n not in a capitalistic ideological sense, but capital. And I guess he was about this. He wasn't interested in this, and I and I, and I think that this, in a certain way, is maybe a, maybe a philosophical. Uh, you know, the people are motivated to do something. And what is motivating the people? What is motiva what is what what is what what means motivation? What means interest? Heidegger spoke of the will to power, of course, but and the, we can say the will to power, for instance, has this capitalistic dimension. But but we have to maybe in this sense he has he has uh, in the sense of the question of capital he had maybe a, a, a blind spot or something. I would say. That. Uh, ik zag jou net met een antwoord. Ja, je mag de andere kant op de microfoon. So you mentioned at the beginning of this uh, debate the fact that you were shocked by the by the fact that uh, Heidegger was uh, had a contact, the brutal facts, and uh, was aware of what happened to the Jews, but in fact he uh, he didn't mention that, or he actually put it in a broader uh, perspective, on in a broader theory. Uh, philosoph he, he tried to philosophize about this fact instead of taking action against it. I don't want to shock, but I just want to come to this moment, to this point, and uh, point out that uh, what happens in the Middle East nowadays, let's say, it's, are also very brutal facts. And uh, it, philosophers don't seem to have much to say about that. Um, maybe they have this tendency toward uh, theorizing and philosophizing and trying to look at the, to, to understand a certain event that takes place at that time when they live in a broader perspective and try to understand it rather than take, than take, uh, take, take action against it. Uh, I'm just wondering if this is not a tendency of philosophy in general. Um, what would you say about that? Well, at first, uh, <clears throat> of course, Heidegger, um, I would say that at, at, at one point uh, of, of his thinking about world Judaism, world Judaism was, was clearly an enemy of the German, of the German Reich, and he, he thought that in this way. He thought it was, a, it was an invisible enemy, because it, in Americanism, Bolshevism, all these uh, protagonists fighting against, German, against Germany, in the background of them, there was world Judaism. So in this respect, he had a clear, for himself, a clear, clear sight on the, on this, on this phenomenon. Uh, he was not able to see, of course, uh, or he was not interested in the victims or whatever. I don't know. So 
you know, he didn't, he didn't see that. Like, well, the other thing is, uh, I don't think I don't think that people, that philosophers only have are interested in in, in, in uh, theories and not don't want to refer to to uh, to uh, con concrete phenomena. Um, but this, especially this, <laughs> well, I, would, I could speak. I could only speak for for me. If I would say something about this problem of Israel and Palestine, that 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 is nearly in every in every respect professional suicide. Yeah. <laughs> and, no, and, but maybe, maybe, uh, and, and the, just, just, just to say quite clear, I guess that this is a point why philosophers really, really are not. Uh, I know that Batimo, for instance, he saw, he, he said something. It was, it was, it was very weak what he said. But he, he said it, and after this, it was an outrage. And then two, two weeks later, he has to, to apologize himself. That does not look very good for a philosopher. So I guess that 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 it's that this is this this is uh, this is yeah that that's a point I guess why philosophers have to be in a certain way very very careful with 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 these statements. My, my example I didn't mention. I, I thought it's I thought it's absolutely. Uh, understood or yeah, self-evident, but obviously it wasn't. I, I When I said brutal facts that happen in the Middle East, I referred actually to the things that happen in northern Iraq. Ah. In Iraq, uh, the brutal acts that uh, ISIS uh, does that, uh, which already ah, okay. shows the, the lack of uh, attention maybe in this part of the world, and also philosophers in Western Europe for the brutal facts that happen there. It's truly are not that, clo that close as, as the persecution of the Jews was to Heidegger. But still, also the world is a little bit, a bit smaller, has a, has become a little bit, a bit smaller than at that time because of internet and so on. So we are actually we should be aware of what happens there, yet we are not. Yeah, I think I think that that most most of the philosophers, um, when they are very really philosophers, um, they <coughs> I guess there is no question. Actually. I hope so. Uh, you cannot imagine that somebody would argue for the easy so that <laughs> but, but yeah it's, it's a... no but um, maybe this has nothing to do with the system I'm, 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 and I, I want to uh, uh, go back to the Holocaust actually okay what I want to say is Adorno of course is one of the philosophers there were more uh, who said that after Auschwitz something has changed maybe for philosophy as well and he tries to incorporate that in his thinking or actually change the way he thinks or philosophy works. Um, is that something that Heidegger should have done? Why, why does Adorno think this is something that changes everything for me as philosopher as well? And Heidegger thought not and remained silent. That had something to do with, the, with how they, with their work, with their thought? No, yeah, but, but, well, at first, of course, it's it's an it's a it's it's a it's a thought. <laughs> Adorno had a had a, like Hannah Arendt. She speaks from a, a, a rupture of, of traditions of, of uh, so, so that's 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 a thought uh, that certain philosophers had that the Holocaust or the Shoah was a unique event and. That it that it is a rupture in the in the history of of, of the Western world, and uh, yeah, and we they were for instance they were criticized even of course uh, because there were other philosophers who said well what about the Kolima what about the Gulags what about other uh, what about the massacres to the Armenians and some so, so, uh, so, 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 so they were the standpoint is itself. Was it in itself criticized, and I guess that in a certain way, uh, maybe um, um, Heidegger thought that well, he was reserved to this idea could be. But this is this is this is then a, a question: what is what what can be discussed? Uh, um, uh, these these the, the, these different thoughts. Uh, we we would we would, for instance, not. Uh, set the Holocaust in certain relations. We think that it is unique, but we 
we we think that of course there are all uh, there are other mass um, other massacres and uh, other genocides who are um, also unique in in itself. Um, so that's a, I guess it's a, it's a wide it's that's a, that's a, that's an open question how to deal with it. But but of course uh, the, the Ordonian Odo, statement, <clears throat> even important for instance for Habermas, are still uh, are still in the in the background of the discussions about the Shoah. And what is of course clear is by the way I just want to say that that the Shoah is is of course the is of course the the horizon in which we discuss these problems. So we. That Heidegger said, had said that, that Heidegger had these anti Semitic or whatever passages uh, are, always, are, of course, uh, uh, related to the Shoah. So the Shoah is in, always in the background. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense to, to not to, to see that, that the Shoah is in the background. Because if, if it wouldn't have happened, we would maybe probably wouldn't care so much about it. But, but it, it happened. Yes. Um. Yes, uh, thank you and thanks for your uh, very fascinating lecture. I have a somewhat different question. In your historical retrospect, you mentioned uh, Greece and uh, Middle Ages and uh, modern times. You skipped the Roman Empire, um, whereas I think that's also an important aspect. I visited uh, Germany a few times recently and I was very uh, keen on well, studying, so to speak, Nazi architecture. And I was once again struck by the fact that this is so very, very Roman. I mean, it's a kind of renaissance or parody of Roman architecture. And for me, that's a very important aspect of, the, of, of Nazism. It is a kind of, well, rebirth of the Roman Empire idea. Uh, for me, that's a very strong aspect. So I'm always a bit confused when I um, think about Heidegger and his idea that uh, his idea about kind of rebirth of the new beginning, uh, the, the, the Greek beginning, the second beginning in Germany, beginning of thinking, beginning of philosophy, how he could somehow connect this with Nazism, because that's, that is for me so very Roman. Uh, whereas Heidegger, when he thinks about Greece and Rome, he says, well, Greece is the authentic beginning, Rome is a kind of degradation, it's a kind of um, a loss already, uh, it's a kind of forgetting. Uh, if Nazism is much more Roman than Greek, so to speak, uh, how could he connect this hope for a new beginning with a movement, a political movement that was so, in its architecture, but also I think in its political ideology, so keen on, let's say, bringing back something like the Roman Empire? I hope my question makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quick, it's clear. Um, well, at first, uh, Heidegger, of course, is, a, is, a, is, is, is criticizing the Romans as a, as a, already as a, um, a destruction of the origin of the Greek origin. So the, the Roman Roman culture for him is is an imperialistic culture in a certain way, and therefore he he criticizes them. But uh, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm not so sure. Well, the Romans, the Romans, the ancient Romans were of course very important for fascism and for Mussolini. And I don't I don't I don't know. I'm not I'm a, I'm a historian. I'm not so sure how how Heidegger really saw, for instance, the the the, the relation between fascism and national socialism. So it, in a certain way, could have, it could be possible that Heidegger maybe thought that. This Roman tradition was more or less uh, represented in Mussolini, and that he thought <coughs> he, of course, if he if he, if he <coughs> heard the, the word Roman, he, he all, already he always heard the background uh, that means Roman, Christian Christianity, yeah, Roman. Then. So I guess that he, I, I, I'm not I'm not so I'm not so very aware of of this of this problem that he maybe have. That he maybe thought, well, this is this is something Italian. That's something fascist. We we are doing something 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 other. So that's maybe that maybe a, a, a point. Well, later, when he spoke about national socialist uh, imperialism, I called that I quoted this. Uh, then uh, then uh, he, he called it imperialism. Then he was quite aware of these of this uh, of this um, connection between 
between the Roman Empire and the Roman attitude in this way and, and uh, the National Socialists. But this is a phenomenon in the late 30s that when he began to, in this point, uh, to criticize the National Socialists, of course. There is, there is, by the way, of course, a critique of National Socialism in this respect. So this is what I would try to say to this, to this, uh, to this point. What, what is, of course, not a response to the question why Heidegger thought that, that the National Revolution um, could be could be a comeback of the of the Greek beginning. Um, that, that that for him was worked only with Hölderlin, so that he was he was only he, he took Hölderlin for the for the guarantee of this of this relation and and of course Hitler and Hölderlin that was not very close. Um, I have one. Last, very short question, because I've been informed that it's time uh, we stop, but we can speak in the cafe afterwards, of course. I hope people, you don't mind people debating with you uh, even more, with beer, that is. But um, um, human life is stained, you said. Is that something that you learned from Heidegger and Learning, yeah, from reading him, seeing that he was an anti-Semite, really was an anti-Semite, something you might not know, you might have known before, or not. <laughs> no, uh, I guess that, um, um, I, I don't know whether this argument is, is, is strong, but I, I thought, of course, we know that, when it's a, in a certain way it's a banality, we say that uh, human life is stained in a certain way, but but you know that the point is, of course, how how we uh, there are cri cri critics of Heidegger who would try to 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 condemn Heidegger and to ban his his work from 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 uh, uh, libraries, uh, bur burn the books of burn the Gesamtausgabe. Uh, fire is purifying everything. Of course, it's a beautiful bu purification. Um, uh, and uh, and Heidegger himself, he like I quoted that he was he, in this time he was he was uh, the, taking this 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 idea of the purification of being seriously. But I think, of course, yeah, that's that's that was my my my. I can emphasize it again that I think that that total enlightenment, the, the total Habermas, for instance. <laughs> uh, do you want the total Habermas? So that uh, is, 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 would be the end of, of, of philosophy. Not that I, that I think that Habermas is not an important and good philosopher, but, it's, it, but, but the argument needs in a certain way, the non-argument, to argue against something. If you just only uh, have arguments and you are thinking of the better argument, that might be interesting in certain whatever uh, seminar discussions, but it's but it's but it, it would be in a certain way the end of of life because life is in itself also darkness. Enlightenment enlightenment needs in a certain way darkness. It, that sounds easy in a certain way and even banal, but I, I think that that we have in this way we have to see that Heidegger is really a a dark stone in the history of of twentieth twentieth century uh, philosophy. And this dark stone, with, the, with, with this dark stone, we can we, we, we can be angry with him. We can we, we can feel a, little, a certain pain with him. But we but we can really think that we need this dark stone in a certain way to understand uh, us uh, as some as people or as thinkers who cannot, of course, who cannot share all the Heideggerian thoughts, and especially not share the, Heide the Heide Heideggerian history of being this narrative. We cannot live in it, but we cannot, in a certain way, we, can, we, we, need, we need him as, as our shadow. Yeah. And, and this is what I actually tried to say. The, the other thing to say, to just, just uh, destroy it, let, let's get rid of this shadow, that, 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 that's not philosophy. In my eyes, that, that's not philosophy. So that, that what I, what I, what I try to say. That, um, one could say that philosophy is always stained philosophy. I, I, I think that, that, that it begins with Plato, we have stained philosophy and it 
we have Nietzsche, and we have Heidegger, we have even Wittgenstein, and we have stains everywhere. And that's 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 I guess uh, even if it's if it if it if it's uh, if it's painful in a certain way, it's okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Peter Trapp. Thank you very much. Thank